Welcome everybody to Config Day 2. My name is Taryn and I'm a design manager on our brand studio team. Um, and I'm really excited to host you here in room 201 today. Um, I'm really excited to be here because I love the intersection of all these fabulous topics and disciplines coming together this week. I love all the dev talk, the design talk, the AI talk, all the brand stuff, of course. If there's any other super design generalists in the room, let's see a show of hands. Shout out. Um, I really especially loved Diana Mounter's talk yesterday about design leadership and the keynote this morning about AI. Oveta is amazing. I'm excited to go back and rewatch and like share it with my mom. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to remind you all, as you explore today, virtually and in person, please use the hashtag and share. We'd love to see your experience. That's config2023. Wherever you hang out online, TikTok, Instagram, and so on. And now for what you're all here for, the Duolingo product crew is in the house. This team is all about embracing art to improve and enhance the language learning experience. They're going to walk us through how they approach creating a systems-driven and art-focused product, and specifically how they've collaborated on this while also creating a better game experience. You're going to see some real files and a peek behind how their characters are built to reflect a really huge range of contextual language situations. So please welcome to the stage Robert, Anna, and Megan from Duolingo. <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you guys so much for coming to this talk. Thank you to Figma for having us. My name is Bobbert, um, I'm a product designer. I'm Anna, also a product designer. And I'm Megan, an illustrator. And we're really excited to be here today to talk about something that we deeply care about, which is how embracing art enhances your products and why your users and your teams will thank you for it. So besides all of us being really big nerds about art, video games, and like pretty much everything in between. Um, we all work together on the design team at Duolingo, an ed tech company whose mission is to provide the best education in the world and to make it universally available. But wait a minute, wait a minute, what e education? Language learning, like what does embracing art have to do with any of that? Well, to answer that, uh, let's introduce you to this little guy. <laughs> so. This is Duo. Um, he's a small green owl. And while he's pretty cute, he's not just here for show. He's here to teach, to motivate, to occasionally threaten, and to uh, <laughs> celebrate you along your language learning journey. But more on that in just a sec. For now, let's talk takeaways. So by the end of this talk, we hope you'll walk away with some new insight on, one, why art is a game changer for improving our product experiences and helping us achieve our goals, both business and user. Two, how to make art systems that scale your product um, and your team. And three, how, to art, how artists and designers can collaborate on out-of-the-box solutions to even your toughest product problems. So if that all sounds fantastic, let's get this party started. Anna, do you want to take it away? Yeah, let's do it. So how is a cartoon owl part of our secret sauce to making learning experiences more effective? Well, to answer that, let's talk about why art is such a game changer for helping learners and users stay motivated, get invested, and frame context when using our products. Staying motivated is one of the hardest and yet most crucial parts of learning a new language or pretty much anything. And the environments we're learning in play a huge part in that. One way to think about it is like how playing a sport can benefit our physical health. It can be hard to get up and run around your yard, as is the case for me. Uh, but once you introduce a ball and some healthy competition, you start to think less about how physically hard it is and more about the ball and the goal. Over time, your physical health improving is a result of the environment you're having fun in. Which brings us back to the app. Because when we sprinkle moments of delight within and around our lessons and our learning experiences, we see people begin to enjoy the experience of learning. 
even when what they're learning is really hard. And this is super important because learning a language isn't just about understanding uh, the vocab, the concepts, the grammar, but putting all of that into practice every single day. And in this way, it's a lot like training a muscle. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So our real challenge then isn't to get learners to do one big lesson every now and then, but for them to do one small lesson every single day. In order to do that, we have to break down the intimidating goal of learning an entire language into these bite-sized pieces that learners feel excited to come back to. So how does art help us do that? Well, in most games, we're rewarded for completing tasks. It's kind of the point. In Duolingo's case, learners are rewarded with these sparkly, gilded chests full of gems when they hit important learning milestones. These gems are like a currency our learners can use to buy special items from our shop. By giving form, color, and variety to these rewards, art helps make accomplishing these goals feel a lot more special and fulfilling. But on top of all the sparkly rewards, there's also the emotional reward of having achieved something and being recognized for it. We lean into this by creating bespoke illustrations, animations, and copy that highlight these goals, which learners love to share and celebrate with their friends. At the heart of many of these moments are Duo and our cast of characters. And I'll hand it off to Bobber to explain why. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. So what happens when characters become like super iconic and start getting a cult following? Well, it turns out that character design is super important to getting people invested, but sometimes a little too much. Take, for example, how pretty much every iconic game franchise starts with a character. Mario is to Nintendo as Pikachu is to Pokemon. Um, but it's not really that common to see products or apps designed with characters at its center. Uh, one, notable exa uh, one notable exemption here are the line friends from Neighbor, uh, which are created as stickers for people to express themselves while they were DMing each other. And that's just it, right? Because we're all empathetic beings, it's natural to see part of ourselves in the characters that we meet. And the more we see them in different contexts, doing different things, the more opportunities that we can create for people to connect with them. This also causes us to pay closer attention to when they're telling us something. We leverage this by making Duo appear basically like everywhere inside and outside of the app, sometimes asking you to make an important decision or even just reminding you to do your lessons. And as we made him harder and harder to avoid, we saw something amazing start to happen. Uh, memes. <laughs> just like <laughs> a, a ton of memes. <laughs> but learners started to jump to their own conclusions about Duo's motives and ended up building a whole personality, lore, and universe around him. Um, some of it less wholesome than others, but we were like, mm, let's just not course correct and just indulge ourselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> and as we started to riff on this lore in some of our features and our socials, <laughs> Uh, like over on our TikTok, our word of mouth growth started to skyrocket. And it, it's just a really great example of how when our characters are genuinely, genuinely relatable to learners, yet still authentic to our mission, people will just start to get really invested. From iterating on learning experiences over the years, we've also found that art plays a huge role in helping us frame what we learn in a memorable context, making it easier to consolidate and recall information. Because here's the thing, memory is context dependent. So for example, consider your tendency to retrace your steps when you've lost your keys. If you return to the right context, you can usually easily find whatever you've lost because your environment has visual cues that help you remember where you've put it. The same principle applies directly to when you learn a language. When we learn something in a specific context, the next time we return to that context, we're more likely to recall it. Uh, however, you know, traditional language learning tends to involve a lot of solitary reading and, and text, while in real life, speaking a language involves interacting with people in a physical environment. So how does art help us bridge this gap? 
by introducing learning content alongside a variety of characters, voices, and scenes, we can emulate the environmental context where you might need to recall or apply those concepts. As our lessons become more and more contextually immersive, we think learners will be better equipped in translating their knowledge to the real world. On top of helping the knowledge stick, art also helps learners pay closer attention to the content we're introducing them to. For example, we found that animating our characters' mouths while an exercise is playing uh, helped le learners listen more closely to what was being said, which in turn helps them complete the exercise more accurately. The longer we can keep a learner's attention using things like animation, the more likely they are to take in the information that we're giving them. So, We've just talked your ear off about how art and character design is such a game changer for supporting our learners and our mission. But before moving on, let's just summarize what you can take away from this. First, art helps us create visually and emotionally engaging environments that people actually want to come back to. In our case, by making the experience of learning feel delightful and rewarding. Secondly, art and character design helps users get pretty invested in the stories we tell about our brand while having a little bit of fun. And last but not least, art helps frame the context around the content so that it's more memorable and applicable to real life. So now that you understand why we care so much about this, let's talk about how any of this gets made. How do we make this scale across an entire product ecosystem. Our job as artists is to make art that supports Duolingo's mission and to make it available to everyone in the company. To do this while keeping up with the continuous growth of our design team, we developed a system. This meant figuring out uh, just the right design ingredients that are both specific enough to help learners identify our character-driven brand, but still universal enough for product designers to use across an endless variety of UI. Since Duolingo teaches millions of words for items that exist in the real world, we use a fun, vibrant art style that lets us communicate effectively. So our first ingredient is bouncy and bright visuals that help, learners, uh, help keep learners engaged with attention-grabbing depictions of recognizable concepts. We give each object a bit of bounce by replacing what would typically be sharp edges with rounded corners and by strategically detaching pieces of illustrations when it's conducive to their shape construction. Notice the leaves. Uh, as for color, uh, since we need to teach, our palette needs to reflect how people actually see things uh, in the real world. So the design trend of uh, using a limited color palette is automatically off limits for us. At Duolingo, we pick from all colors of the rainbow. With such a broad range of colors, we also need uh, to keep a few consistent elements to establish uh, recognizable brand colors like bumping up the saturation to keep things cheerful, bright, and attention-grabbing, and leaning certain directions for each hue. For example, our blues tend to lean more turquoise instead of purple, and our reds tend to lean more magenta instead of orangey red. For an extra sprinkle of delight, we occasionally choose quirky colors for everyday objects, as long as it's still clear what those objects are. For example, a pink washing machine or a purple TV. The most important thing is that we use art to communicate ideas effectively, which brings us to ingredient number two, simple and intentional shapes. These allow us to visually communicate concepts quickly and clearly. At the end of the day, our goal is to express ideas with only the most important details. Take a look at these illustrations of a cat, for example. If we look at the cat with six shapes, we see that not including enough detail may cause learners to be confused and not understand information in a lesson. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, adding too many shapes to our illustrations makes the idea far less readable at a glance and deters from the main point of the lesson. It's all about finding the right balance. We know that with the right colors and composition, the objects and concepts we need to illustrate can be clearly communicated with very few cleverly placed vector shapes. Ultimately, our illustrations will live on a screen, sometimes a really small screen. So we make sure our artwork is framed with white negative space and constructed of clearly recognizable detail so each illustration enhances our learner's app experience and never interrupts it. 
personality and charm. Ingredient number three. This is the spice we add to create an environment that is fun to learn in and that feels close to what you would encounter in the real diverse world. We consider the basic principles of character design, prop design, storytelling, uh, to exaggerate key details, almost to the point of caricature. Combine exaggeration with rhythm, using a strategic variety of shapes and sizes, and you have an illustration instantly recognizable and worthy of a smirk or chuckle. We put humor into our art by defying the laws of physics, stretching characters' bodies to hit funny poses, pushing facial expressions to humorous limits, and overall just give stronger acting performances. This absolutely wacky approach is super entertaining, and it also makes our stories really memorable. Humor is, the key to, humor is key to making a fun learning environment that learners want to come back to. Drop these humorous moments into the context of real-world situations, and we create memorable stories that feel welcoming because they're familiar to our everyday lives. With bright colors, intentional shapes, and personality, we aim to make our learner's language journey engaging, clear, and memorable. Okay, so we've chosen the ingredients. Now, what do we do with them? When we took a look back at the reasons art supports product, like helping learners stay motivated, get invested, and framing context to help the knowledge stick, we came up with an idea. So earlier we talked about the co-evolution of Duo alongside our learner audience and how that's informed our overall approach to leveraging characters in our brand. So we thought if learners were doing this with just one character, why not offer a whole cast of them? We could have created a cast of blue and purple and pink friendly woodland creatures to complement our green owl, but we didn't want to make language learning feel like something that only exists in a fantasy world. It's something that happens to real people living in this world. So from the get-go, we knew we wanted our characters to be a diverse cast of humans. By designing our characters as humans, in a small way we're reflecting our user base, people who use Duolingo every day. This, made, this task meant taking hundreds of millions of people around the world and condensing that down to only eight character designs, a number that was small enough to form a memorable, tight-knit friend group, and yet big enough to capture a decent range of cultures, per perspectives, and personality types. So when we began by designing our bite-sized Motley crew, we knew we needed to make these characters look and feel like they belong in the same universe as Duo. So, our first step was to dissect Duo down into his most essential pieces. His simple construction, his big eyes, his detached feet. These are the key building blocks we use to design Duo's new friends. Our next design goal was to explore what kind of characters we could create when we started with these key building blocks. Since Duolingo needed to finalize the characters' appearances before establishing each of their story arcs, our artists needed to create eight distinct combinations of shapes and sizes that visually hinted at a variety of personality types and lifestyles. So we started with uh, those key building blocks and some very basic shapes, squares, circles, triangles, and built the characters up from there because you can usually tell a lot about a character from just their basic shape construction, if they're good or evil, shy or outgoing, strict or aloof. Uh, the same logic applies to our world characters. Lily's triangles and sharp points spark her abrasiveness and edgy remarks, while Zari's circles and swoops inspire her bubbly charisma. Each character in the Duolingo cast uses one prominent shape in their design to help communicate a persona. We take each character's shape motif and infuse it with a splash of rhythm to create size variation and an appealing, balanced design. After a ton of exploration, that gave us eight striking silhouettes, each outlining a human, a unique human, ready to fully find their voice and personality. Eventually, because these character designs were handled by a lot of different people in the company, each of the characters' stories blossom naturally. The personalities evolved based on everyone's interpretations of their designs and the ways we were all discovering how the characters could help us meet our goals. Our characters are as complex and multifaceted as we are, as humans, which can make it hard to know what situations or conversations it makes sense to include them in. 
the culmination of all of this world building logic, design, and experimentation we've discussed so far eventually led us to a solution, and that's our world character system. Each character is accompanied by a source of truth, which documents the ingredients that make up their personality, their motivations, their likes and dislikes, as well as how their personality is communicated visually through facial expressions, poses, colors, and size relative to other characters. Documentation like this is essential for artists when uh, use drawing, using it as reference for drawing, and it's also become an invaluable resource for the design team as a whole. Whenever a writer reviews a character's flaws to form a convincing plot twist in one of our stories, or whenever a product designer grabs from a selection of character poses to add to the screen they're building. Outside of the world character system, we've developed a similar solution for offering guidelines around pretty much every illustration in the app. Our art library, as we call it, is a Figma project that categorizes art by use case, from vocab illustrations and lessons, to images made for unique requests, to icons across the app, and more. No surprise that we have a ton of art of Duo, so he gets his own art library file. Organizing and documenting our art this way makes it more accessible for the many different people interested in using it in their work by making it faster to find and easier to plug and play. So with all the systems, guidelines, and libraries we have in place, where is there wiggle room for us to evolve? Great question. <laughs> I'll answer that. Uh, so like we just talked about, having an established art system does a lot of things. It speeds up our production pipeline and also makes sure our art is always feeling cohesive. But it's just as important that we keep it flexible enough to let our visual language evolve as our product and brand does. The key to doing this is striking just the right balance between consistency, so our brand is immediately recognizable, and context, so our message can adapt to all the different audiences and environments our art lives in. For example, in cases outside of the app where we want to draw attention, like our iOS streak widget, we push our art style with gradients and different compositions to emphasize the rainbow of emotions we want to convey. And we do this for extra special occasions as well, like in our year in review feature, where we match every learner with a unique archetype based on their learning habits. The idea here is that when we create art that deviates significantly from the visual language of the app, it makes learners pay attention to what we're saying and gets them more excited about sharing these moments with their friends. Sometimes deviating from our standard shape language helps us connect our brand to visual cultures all over the world, like in Japan where our very own Megan here covered a, a giant gadgetpon machine in anime-inspired drawings of our characters. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> Other times, it lets us bring language learners together at home, like at our very own Pittsburgh-based taqueria, where people can order in Spanish to get a discount. <laughs> Come through. <laughs> <laughs> Deviating from our typical art style here in the brand and interior design was necessary and making this feel like a space you could come relax in and enjoy some top-notch tacos. So, by combining an understanding of this established art system and combining that with the context-specific user and product needs we need to account for, our design team is able to push our brand into really exciting directions, both digital and physical. So you just saw how our brand extends to different kinds of contexts, but let's actually take a step back to the core Duolingo app. Well, it turns out that those same ingredients that make up our art system also apply to our own UI design system. So let's talk a little bit more about how we've let our art and our UI evolve together. So Duolingo has had about three-ish distinct design systems over time. And so when, you sh when shown in a lineup, it's pretty tempting to see these redesigns as a gradual refinement of an aesthetic. But really, each redesign was a super big undertaking at the time, and each led to some paradigm shifts in both our art systems and our UI systems. So 
Fast forward to today, and we now use a design system whose foundations involve the same ingredients that our artists use. Um, so let's revisit those art ingredients that Megan just talked about um, and see how product designers apply them to the design system, starting with Bouncy and bright visuals. Um, in the UI UX world, this ingredient can translate to making any important action or idea pop. Take this example in our lessons where we introduce new words with this sparkly purple tag. Uh, this helps learners to pay closer attention to the word and invites them to tap on it uh, to see its translation. Here's another example where we theme our UI based on different seasonal events each month. If a learner does a ton of lessons and fills up that progress bar all the way, they earn those cute collectible badges that you see on that bottom right of the screen there. So in this case, we use color to highlight our progress bar UI and that badge so that learners stay motivated to filling it up before the month is done. Um, we also source that UI color from our monthly illustrations too, which Megan originally designed. <laughs> Our second ingredient, simple and intentional shapes, focuses on establishing visual harmony between our art language and our UI. So you probably already noticed that uh, pretty much all of our UI is influenced by our art shape language. It's simple, it's soft, and it's super easy to work with. Uh, and it also translates well across different design patterns, making them feel cohesive and like a part of the Duolingo universe. Now, last but not least, personality and charm. Um, in the UI UX, UX world, this is all about creating memorable moments that stick in our learners' minds. Um, so how do we inject our design system full of personality? Well, with words, uh, funny, relatable words. Our design system's content design guidelines make sure our product voice is expressive and playful. And so when doing their lessons, our learners sometimes find really crazy phrases that help them remember key examples of grammar concepts like eating bread and crying on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> on our home screen, um, we incorporate charm and personality by theming every single one of our units to our characters, which helps our learners distinguish them from one another. And I think it's pretty fair to say that our home screen is a good example of all three of our ingredients working together. Um, making important things pop with color, establishing visual harmony with our shape language, and creating memorable moments with our art. So to summarize, even though we product designers interpret our ingredients differently, their core principles still stay the same. This ensures that our artists and our product designers are all on the same page when it comes to how we express our visual language in our app. At the end of the day, our art and UI don't exist in silos. They evolve together by following this recipe. Figure out what your art needs to do in your product and identify the key ingredients that will get you there. Then build your system around those ingredients to accomplish what your art system needs to do and make sure it's easy for your stakeholders to use. Keep your art system flexible enough to adapt across endless use cases by finding the right balance between consistency and context and finally, let your art and UI systems evolve together so you can build a product that solves problems in novel ways. Which brings us to... So at this point, you might be thinking, do we involve artists in every single thing that we do at Duolingo? Well, that would be pretty sick. Art resources at Duolingo are in such high demand that we always have to prioritize where they're being used. So when would we decide to bring artists onto a project? And what does that collaboration look like? We're going to show you. First of two case studies, this first example is a true partnership between product design and art, which was a major update we made to our course navigation experience. This feature, which my team and I launched earlier this year, introduced learning milestones that help learners navigate our courses and feel more motivated to complete them. But to explain why this project exists, we'll have to rewind back to two home screen redesigns ago. So back when the app looked like this, we discovered that a lot of learners didn't feel like they knew how to use Duolingo in the best or right way. And that wasn't a huge surprise. In fact, by this point, we had internally started referring to the home screen as a kitchen sink offering too many different things to practice at once without providing a ton of guidance around where to start. 
our massive home screen redesign that launched earlier this year was our solution to this, by flattening all of these options into a single step-by-step -step lesson plan. But of course, by introducing any major change, you're bound to have some challenges be replaced with others. And so in our case, by flattening our multi-level skills in the old design down to its individual five levels on the path, we were literally multiplying the scrolling length of our courses. So with a brand new path sprawling ahead and no clear indication of how long it'll take to complete, it makes sense that we started to see learners feel a little bit more wary about making progress. The good thing was that our goal was pretty clear. We needed to make navigating easier and less overwhelming, and we also needed to make course progress feel a lot more meaningful. So learners trust that Duolingo is actually helping them reach their learning goals. By this point, product and content design had done a bit of work exploring what that might look like, including what information about our courses we wanted to convey. But pretty quickly, we found ourselves running up against a problem, which was that uh, there was just simply way too much course information to show at once. So when the majority of our learners are used to delight at every turn of the app, how are we going to get them to read several paragraphs worth of text? An impossible challenge. We needed to make the course feel less like a textbook and more like a game. So naturally, it was time to bring in the experts. And that's where my team came in. But this wasn't a typical collaboration, and let me explain why. The art team at Duolingo gets a lot of requests from product and marketing teams for these like ultra-specific asks, one-time use. So they'd be like, hey, Megan, could you draw in less of an illustration of Zari, but make it that one meme? And I'm like, heck yes. <laughs> um, uh, because these types of asks are pretty straightforward, they tend not to require too much back and forth. Um, but with this ask, the course navigation ask, uh, things were a bit trickier. Even though product design had a general idea of how visual storytelling might make the course navigation experience more effective, uh, they weren't sure exactly yet what that art should be of and, and where it should appear. And so while projects like these tend to be filled with a lot more ambiguity and, and back and forth in the beginning, but that shouldn't scare anybody away at all. In fact, inviting artists into the product development process earlier gives us more of an opportunity to shape the product direction and experience overall. So soon after this little DM exchange, Art and I went back to the drawing board, but with people that could actually draw. So together, we started exploring concepts for a creative direction around course navigation. One of the perks, one of the many perks of designing a game is all the research we do, <laughs> which is playing lots of them. And as it turns out, many of our favorite games have in some shape or form already addressed the problem we were trying to solve. Inspired by games like Overcooked and Mario Party, some of our absolute faves, we started thinking about how bright and bold environmental storytelling could help us break up the course into tangible visual milestones. So starting with sketches, the artists and I played on a few different concepts for these milestones. So maybe course progress is uh, tokens that you collect along the path. Maybe it's Duo getting progressively shredded as he levels up his skills. <laughs> Uh, or maybe it's traveling with Duo as he goes on cooler and crazier adventures with his friends. But after developing and testing with learners, this last one was our winner. It was fun to look at, simple to understand, and conveyed a sense of increasing difficulty as learners progress through a course. This also represented a turning point for product, because having just visualized a small fraction of this concept, that was already enough for me to go off and finalize the UX while our artists fleshed out the rest of the art. So using this narrative, artists got together to brainstorm the nine assets for the nine sections to make up some of our longest courses. Some things we needed to think about at this point were things like, how does each character's personality influence the type of adventure they would take you on? And how might we make this narrative system scalable since the sequence or number of sections of our courses will inevitably grow? As we dove deeper into sketching for each section, we made sure that 
each had their own distinctive background color, so they were e easily differentiable, that each activity could loop continuously as an animation in a confined amount of space that we had on screen, and that we represented a varying range of intensity levels for us to match to the gradual increasing difficulty of course progress. So as art was honing in on our final assets, product and I were honing in on the final screens and flows. This meant that we were at a point where we could start converging because even though we had aligned on the assets that we needed, we would still need to stress test them against all of the different places and contexts they would need to live in. And the secret sauce to doing this was creating a shared workspace in Figma. Thank you, Figma. <laughs> stress testing the assets here was as easy as plug and playing them inside of every screen, every mode, every edge case they would need to work in. And as the artist and I jammed in this file, which is too big to fully display here, it was amazing to have a shared space where both product and art facing constraints could be flagged, talked about, and iterated on really quickly. For example, a first pass of our assets revealed there's a lot more work we needed to do to make text and UI elements read clearly. So using the shared space, as well as the many amazing plugins from Figma community, thank you Figma community, artists and I iterated together on more accessible color palettes for illustrations and UI. Another example is that this workflow helped us figure out what the requirements of the final illustration compositions would be. Like in this example, while the emotion of Eddie spiraling down a mountain uh, via skiing, uh, it was working in some ways, the full bleed composition made the art look incomplete or broken when swiping between sections. By opting to keep the entire scene visible in each composition, the transitions now felt a lot smoother. And with just a few more rounds of stress testing the art in Figma, we had finally brought Duo's adventure to life. Before wrapping up this case study, let's talk about the impact that this art-driven approach had on the problems we set out to solve. So what we found was this was a huge win for navigation, showing one section at a time while obscuring completed ones, addressed this infinite scroll problem, and was encouraging learners to keep moving forward instead of going back to do easier content. We also found that learners who experienced and engaged with this content trusted us more to help them reach their learning goals. And as a result, learners were not only spending more time learning, but also challenging themselves by doing harder and harder content. So that's course navigation. Um, that's just one example of many of how artists influence the creation of entirely new features in our app. And it's safe to say that the conceptual and technical expertise that our artists bring to these projects are a huge key to their success. But sometimes we need that same sprinkle of creative magic on features that already exist to push them in more exciting and engaging directions. So, I'll pass it off to Bobbert to talk more about that. Thank you, Anna. So for our second case study, I'm going to be talking about our premium subscription, Super Duolingo, which went through a massive rebrand in late 2021. Uh, but before we dive deeper into what we made, let's talk a little bit more about what came before Super Duolingo and why it needed a rebrand in the first place. So before Super Duolingo came Duolingo Plus in early 2017. Uh, this was our first iteration at creating a brand around a premium subscription tier. We put Duo in this cute astronaut outfit, and all of our UI used this deep blue color to, that felt a lot more sophisticated than the rest of our color palette at the time. Plus, it was really great for learners who were really dedicated, uh, since they got extra features that made their learning journey more efficient and a lot more personalized. But we kept on developing more and more features for Duolingo Plus, and then we pretty quickly realized that its brand identity didn't really reflect the core message that we wanted to convey. Both the astronaut duo and the deep blue color wasn't really hitting the mark as a special feeling color. Um, like As a product designer working on the system, I always found it really difficult to make our in-app promotions just differentiated enough from the core Duolingo experience. And that's super important to get more people converting to our subscription. Um, our senior leadership started to realize this too, and so we started to think, how might we rebrand the identity of our subscription to reflect our core messaging and to just look really special? And to do that, we started with creative direction. So we on the product side teamed up with the art team uh, to concept some new colors, illustrations, and an overall experience that people would be super excited about. 
And so we started sketching. Um, the first thing our artist tried was super speed, uh, which you can see on the left. But for this, we really didn't think Duo looked unique enough to stand out as a sub-brand. Another idea that you can see on the right was just making Duo really chonky, because we just <laughs> we wanted to convey the plethora of features that you can get by subscribing. But same issue here. Duo just didn't really look unique enough. And then we came up with this superpower idea, and it actually ended up becoming the winner, and for a couple of different reasons. Um, gradients are only used in special occasions, so this made the subscription feel super premium. Duo got to keep his over, overall silhouette, which our brand team really liked, and we found that the name Super could be translated pretty well across different languages. So the artists started to generate more sketches of the style, thinking about how we can make Duo and even the rest of the world characters feel powered up, since that was the emotion that we wanted our uh, subscribers to feel. And here are some of the poses our artists spun up. We ended up using this purple-blue gradient because of how distinct it felt compared to our standard green duo. And also unlike normal duo, Super Duo is rarely on he his feet. And when he is, he's skating around. Doing this helped his movements stay, uh, feel super fluid and effortless, and uh, all, all because we wanted our learners to uh, feel that way when they subscribed. So we had a direction we really liked, and now it was time stress testing the art <laughs> against our UI. We checked screens like the iOS homepage since we wanted our subscribers to have a special app icon. Um, we wanted to make sure that Duo's face was still recognizable at a glance and that it still felt like Duolingo. We also thought about the app open experience and how our green color could transition to the new, to the new green gradient. Um, since Duo's big bright green face was such an iconic part of this experience, we just wanted to make sure that it didn't really look too jarring going from bright to dark or from face to body. And we also thought about our badges and our icons, too, asking ourselves, would they look funky against our existing flat color palettes, or um, would they look distracting? And so we kept on doing this for pretty much every screen in our app, constantly coming up with more UI UX questions, brought all these mocks to our CEO, only for him to say, not including green will be as detrimental as getting rid of Duo, which we initially didn't agree with, because like, we were super laser focused on differentiating him from the core brand. But you know what? We were like, OK. Let's see what things we can come up with. So the artist went back to the drawing board, making a lot more explorations to see how that green could possibly work. And not even after a couple of days, we came up with this. We were like, yeah, this feels super nice. Um, it took the color spectrum from two colors to three colors, which we hadn't really considered in the past, but it brought us closer to the core brand. And folks in user research also felt that Duo felt happier with the green, whereas with just the pink and the blue, he felt a little voidy and cold. And speaking of cold, uh, we went back to stress testing these new assets, but then we started to notice something uh, feel a little bit weird. Um, our artists originally pitched having a deep purple color as the background to make the highly vibrant super illustration stand out. But we found that without the assets, those screens felt a little bit more voidy and flat. Another iteration later, and we ended up with the muted version of the gradient as our background. Um, found in user research that it helped out in two ways. Our learners could more easily recognize the brand, and two, they also felt that it was much more premium feeling. We were feeling like this was looking really hot, and we brought it to final approval, and they were like, yeah, this is looking really cute, so time for implementation. And that brings us to making the new system easy to access. Uh, we ended up creating like an entirely new bespoke arm of our design system, which we call the Super Duolingo Library. This file was what we ended up handing off to engineers, where we documented illustration assets, special edge cases, accessibility, mm, everything. <laughs> and on this particular page itself is our color system, which we documented hex, hex codes for our use cases and our color palettes. And this system also covered every single UX flow and the main differences between plus and super, which is really important for our engineers in the initial conversion process. Here's a page from our system that covered our UI icons. And finally, here's a page from our illustration library. Um, anyways, this system ended up becoming a really important part of scaling our design work. Uh, we actually didn't have a reliable source of truth before this when we were still Duolingo Plus, so now all of our product designers and engineers use it as one. Um, on top of that, our animators also use it as reference, and they end up making stuff like these baddies. Um, these are snippets from our animated promos, and it was just so insanely incredible uh, seeing how quickly they took the system and ran with it to make stuff like this. So TLDR, there was a revenue win and a brand recognition win. 
We saw more free users subscribing, more current subscribers recognizing the brand as premium as opposed to the old colors. And we found that more people were starting more family plans after the rebrand, which meant more people to share the super love. And that's Super Duolingo. Um, once again, none of this could have happened without our incredible design studio team uh, and our team working with me and the product team every step of the way. I've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So we learned a lot about having art and design put their heads together on these two projects, but if we had to boil down our learnings to just two takeaways, they'd have to be, one, letting creatives take the first step, and that's because artists have this incredible ability of bringing the ambiguous ideas that we have, uh, that we think about in the product world, into sketches that we can see and respond to. And they do it fast and at super high quality. Bringing us to our next takeaway, which is that you should partner designers with artists. Um, our roles make us advocate for different things in the creative process, but we're all still working towards the same goal. So at a certain point, we need to translate our shared visions into reality. So that was a lot. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, so as we wrap up here, we hope that sharing our experiences has got you thinking more about how to embrace and scale art in ways that support your users and your mission, as well as how art partners with design to solve problems in really novel and delightful ways. But what do we got cooking up next? Two things. One is making our learning mirror even more real life context so that over time we can close the gap between listening and speaking in the app and listening and speaking in the real world. And secondly, we're pretty excited about making learning in the app feel a lot more personalized by giving learners tools to express themselves in the Duolingo universe. But before we leave, we have just one final thing to say. And that's to hire more artists. <laughs> we hope that over the course of this talk, we've shown you how essential artists are in bringing product experiences to life. We can say with confidence, we wouldn't be where we are today without them. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for sticking around.